We are in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. I got everything written out for, uh, uh, for 1 through 26 on the notes. Uh, this chapter, of course, is uh, the story of Cain and Abel, uh, and we're going to cover that tonight and look, look at some information. But a lot of the interesting stuff that c- probably gets neglected is towards the end of the chapter when it starts talking about Cain's line. And I'm looking forward to getting into that here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but what ends up happening there is you get a whole, whole civilization coming out of Cain's line that ends up getting wiped out in the flood. Uh, but they have advances like Cain. One of the things that's interesting about this is Cain is going to be uh, driven from the presence of the Lord. So Adam and Eve went outside of the Garden of Eden, and it appears that Cain and Abel are bringing offerings up to the gates of the Garden of Eden in the presence of the Lord, as if there's a temple there. Again, it, it, we call it a garden, but God's presence is there. And there's cherubim there guarding the way to the Tree of Life. And so they apparently come up to the edge of it. You know, where do they offering the offerings? Because Adam and Eve live outside. But then Cain is driven further to the east, and he's going to be a, uh, a, a wanderer. And uh, the ground no longer will produce for him. And it gives this idea of just this wandering nomad uh, of no place to go. But as the chapter ends, do you know what Cain does? This doesn't work for him. I mean, there's no, there's no production. There's no food. There's, there, there's nothing. And so he ends up building a city. And so you get your first city out of this, which is going to be kind of interesting because now cities begin to develop. And then now within that city... Uh, we start the chapter off with uh, Cain doing what his father's always done. His father was designed, created to be a, a worker of the garden, working with the soil. And then uh, he's sent out to continue to work the soil, except it's going to you know, be hard with pain. Cain does the same thing. He's a tender or he's a worker of the soil and produces crops. Well, once, once he fails in that you know, as far as his character, his sin, <clears throat> that is cut off for him. He becomes a wanderer and ends up creating a city, probably to collect people so that they can, everybody can work together uh, because they, they can't do these things alone. Abel is going to be uh, watching the sheep. He's going to be, in a sense, a, a, a shepherd. And so the two basic things are going to be crops and animals at the beginning of the chapter. By the time you get to the end, there, they, there, there's, there's musicians, there's, there's people that are, are uh, creating metal, you know, be tools and uh, weapons that they're, they're forging, and all of that is taking place in the city. So a lot of things happen in this chapter besides just Cain killing Abel. Sometimes it comes up uh, that th- there's no continuity between you know, the first story and the second story here, and someone's just putting pieces together. Uh, but there's a lot of similarities, and I, that's why I start on top of page one. Just some similarities. There's many more. I, you could get into more. The, I even was reading one of the commentaries, and they're counting words and how the, there's seven this and seven this, and there's five times seven this, and everything's duplicated in the chapters. I thought it sounded a little bit like numerology, and it was accurate, uh, but I didn't know how much value it was. So I, I kind of chose some of the things here that just kind of show you that the same author and the same style is taking place. Uh, the similarities are the divine questions in chapter 3 and chapter 4 is, uh, you know, where are you and what have you done? God at questions Adam, questions a, a Cain tonight. Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden. And actually, in the Hebrew, it's just the word voice. You know, voice in the garden. It was God's voice was in the garden. And the Lord says to uh, Cain tonight, he's going to say, I, I tra- wrote it, listen to the voice, or, or listen to voice. And that, that in the Hebrew is just the word voice, your brother crying out, hear the voice. And so voice is used in both chapters in the confrontation. Uh, the cursed, uh, we see the cur- serpent being cursed and the ground being cursed in chapter 3. Tonight, Cain himself is going to be cursed. Uh, grace and provision for, for both Adam and Cain. Adam was given clothing and the potential of growing a crop, although it's going to be work hard, and producing an offspring that's going to bring about some kind of deliverance. Uh, Cain 
when he complains about being a wanderer, he says, I'm not going to make it. Someone's going to kill me. He says, okay, I'll put a mark on you. Again, one of those, mis- what, what kind of mark is it? We'll get to that sometime. Uh, but Adam was given clothing. Cain is given a mark. Uh, in here tonight, you can remember uh, the woman was told your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. The same words are used tonight for Cain when he wonders why his offering's not being accepted or whatever's going on there. God tells him uh, that there's a, someone desires to have him, but he himself is going to have to rule over. There's a desire for you, you're going to have to rule. So like the woman says, you're going to desire your husband, but he's going to rule over you. Cain has said someone desires you, but you're going to have to rule it. And that's an important point I don't want to forget. When he, Cain is confronted before he commits his sin, he has a, a free choice. He, he is not trapped. He's not destined for this. When he, his offering is rejected by God, if we can use the term rejected, and we'll talk about this, uh, it's not accepted. Um, he comes and questions Cain with the idea of bringing him to a place of, let's, do you think something's wrong? Can we talk about this and I can maybe lead you, to, lead you out of this? Cain has nothing to do with it, but God doesn't want to confess it. But God gives him, he says, listen, you're on dangerous territory. There's something that desires to have you, but you're going to have to rule it. Giving him the, the idea right here that it, it's up to you now. This thing wants to desire you. You can stop it. You have the potential of stopping this if you will rule it. Cain chooses to follow after uh, what is desiring him, thinking it, you know, it's his own choice or his own desire, but that desire is to, it's, it's a sinful desire that's going to conquer him. We'll talk about that. Expulsion, both out of the garden towards the east. Adam and Eve are moved out of the garden to the east. Cain moves further to the east from the garden. Adam and Cain both worked the soil. Adam and Cain both failed concerning fruit. Adam ate the fruit that he wasn't supposed to. Cain offered the fruit and it wasn't accepted uh, adam and cain are separated from god by this they 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 knew something they were questioned by god they were sentenced by god and they were driven away the next thing on that page is something you've seen before uh, I, i've seen it preached i've seen it in facebook posts i've seen it in youtube videos uh, sometimes you see a reel of a pastor saying this and some pastors do such a good job of, of rattling this off that it's very it's very i don't know emotional it's very powerful me i'm just going to list it here uh and there's there's several things that could be added to this and different ways of putting this list together but the similarity between uh and now i what i just showed you was the similarities between chapter three and four which gives the impression they're they're the same unit they, they go together they're not like stories that were just made up um but this now is a comparison between Adam's fail and Jesus, his redemption. Where Adam fails, Jesus picks it up and puts it back in place. And the similarities are fairly astonishing. If, and there's verses listed there. I'll just read through this quickly. Uh, Adam was the son of God. And again, the term was a son of God doesn't mean he was Jesus. Uh, but Jesus is the son of God also. Adam was created to rule the earth. Jesus was begotten to rule the earth. Adam was a man who sought to become like God. Jesus was God who humbled himself and became like man. And and for the purpose of reversing what Adam did. So they both are set in this position. Adam messes his up. Adam gets his bride Eve from his side. Jesus gets his bride the church from his side. So, you know, Adam is cut on the side or his rib is taken from the side. At, Jesus himself is also cut on the side. Uh, Adam yielded to temptation in the Garden of Eden. Jesus overcame temptation in the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean, Jesus could have failed in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, just like Adam failed, like, uh, potentially, hypothetically. Adam blamed his bride for the sin at the Garden of Eden. Jesus became the sin for his bride and died on the cross for his bride. Adam ate the forbidden fruit, and, the, and a covenant was broken, Hosea 6, 7. Jesus ate the bread and the wine, and a covenant was established. Adam was naked and was later clothed by God. Jesus was clothed and was stripped naked by men. Adam brought thorns and thistles. 
and those same thorns and thistles were wrapped into a crown and put on Jesus' head. Adam brought death by eating from the tree. Jesus brings life from dying on a tree. Adam was the gardener in paradise, and you've always wondered about that verse, and I'm not sure if this is a, like the slam dunk connection, but it's interesting that when the women, Mary, was in the garden looking for Jesus, someone appears, and she thought it was the gardener. She addresses Jesus as the gardener. So Adam was the original gardener in paradise, but when Jesus comes out of the tomb, Mary first thinks he's a gardener uh, after his resurrection, which I'm not sure what the connection is there, but nonetheless, it's there to be made. Now, uh, I'm going to take, first of all, and uh, I'll read the NIV so I can just, I've got the text, and then we'll go to the, we'll look at the notes. But I, I want to read the, the whole chapter, uh, just so you can see it kind of develop, uh, and listen to the names, particularly, if you look on page 3, I've got the names of the... Uh, the men that are mentioned here and in several cases their occupation is listed so Adam worked the ground Abel was a keeper of the sheep Cain was a worker of the ground uh, and then began to become a builder of a city then Enoch Arad Mahujalah, Methusel Lamech and then Lamech's children Jabal was a dweller in tents and had livestock Jubal played the lyre and the pipe Tubal Cain was a forger of tools and weapons of bronze and iron. And then Seth, Cain and Abel's brother, had a son named Enosh. And in Enosh's day, the chapter ends, men began to call on the name of the Lord. Which is interesting, it isn't until the end of this chapter, it wasn't until Adam's grandson, that men began to call on the name of the Lord. Now, what that, it's like, what does that mean? Does that mean no one's praying, no one's having worship service, no one's seeking God uh, after Cain and Abel. Uh, and then Seth's son begins to, uh, we'll look at that and try to, some of these things like we've talked before, they're so far back and they're in such a different time that general statements like men began to call on the name of the Lord. I mean, when we call on the name of the Lord, you call for help? Are, are they desperate? Were they just kind of in a general fellowship and now they're getting so far gone that they're reaching out and trying to seek God? Again, we'll talk about that. But there's a little family tree also I put together. Nothing unique about that except Cain's line is going to end with Jabel, Jubal, Tubal, Cain, and Nama, which would be his daughter. They're uh, Lamech's children. It is assumed that they all died in the flood. It, it, again, because that, that, that's, again, it, does, it maybe goes on a couple more generations. But it, the, you can see they're very developed. They've got musicians uh, that are not just playing the flute and the, the lyre, the flute and stringed instruments. They are probably performing in the cities. Uh, you've got weapons and you've got tools that are being made. Uh, cities have developed. I mean, the ci first city was made by Cain. So you can imagine all the cities that were built by those that followed. We get that... Uh, secular humanistic idea that again these guys are cavemen and that they're just you know digging in the dirt looking for bugs or something uh and you you miss the concept that that's the secular humanist naturalist idea coming out of evolution but we go back to the idea that if god created adam in the garden of eden and and they are strong they are intelligent they have dominion uh they rule the earth that within these generations, uh, they're advancing technically or techni tech with technology uh, much faster than an evolutionist would assume. So much so that God has to destroy the world with a flood, wipe out creation, wipe out humanity, and, and start again. So something was happening with, with that line. Uh, also, I want to point out as we go through this, we have a listing of people, and, and, and um, you know, you've just got this list of people here. And, and uh, you know, in our story tonight, chapter 4, there's Adam, there's Eve, there's Cain and Abel. So there's four people on the earth. But as you know, uh, Cain is going to go off and, and, and find a woman to marry. It's like, whoa, that causes a problem. Where did she come from? And... And, of course, Abel 
doesn't mention his wife. But it's possible, when you, especially when you start doing the, the math, and I almost, I thought about it, and I, I didn't take time to do it, but it's like anything, when you start taking 2, and then you multiply it by 2 and get 4, and multiply that by 2 and get 8, multiply that by 2 and get six, and pretty soon it's 16, then 32, things start to mu multiply very fast. And so, in my mind, my Sunday school mind, Eve has how many children? Cain, Abel, and Seth. Abel is dead. Cain marries somebody. Well, where'd she come from? And then Seth goes off, and it's like, you know, when, when Cain killed Abel, he killed 25% of the world's population. Okay, that's a very simplistic way of looking at it. If Eve is having children, you know, and she's the mother of all life, and, and the ideal is her role, just like at ma man's job is to take care of the fields, produce the fruit, her job is to have children, especially with salvation connected to it. Within, you know, 50 years, she could have had 25 children, if going every two years, if you want to do that. Again, times were different. Well, in 25 years, uh, some of those children are daughters, and they've started having children, or, you know, in, in 50 years, or how you're doing that. And as they start having children, by the time uh, Adam has a son named Seth, he's 130 years old when Seth is born, uh, there, there could be an, uh, uh, an astronomical amount of people on the earth at that time. So just because we're given this sketchy list of people doesn't mean that is the only people living on the earth. We've got to, especially, okay, I mean, you say, well, that, that's possible, but I doubt it. Okay, remember, Adam has a son named Cain who kills his brother, who is then sent away to become a wanderer. He tries that. It doesn't work. And decides, you know what I'm going to do in this chapter? He ends up building a city and naming it after his son. So he names the first city after his son. Well, now, who's living in that city? Enoch or Cain, his wife and his son, Enoch? I mean, three people in a city? I mean, right away, the very, the very fact that you say he built a city, and this would be Enoch, would be Adam's grandson. And Adam's grandson is the name of a city built by Adam's son, Cain, which means there's got to be some people on the earth. And, and city doesn't have the ideal of village. City has the concept of something much bigger. So keep that in mind as you read through this. Uh, these people are very intelligent. They're apparently multiplying quickly, multi in, 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 in multiplying, and they end up in cities. So here we go. I'm going to read chapter 4. And I'm saying that because when, when I read this, I have to purposely take the caveman in. I'm not sure what you, how it is in your mind. But in my mind, when I'm reading, there's pictures. And, and you know, you got this illustration. You have this perception. And you read it through that lens. And I have, because of television shows, because of pictures, because of public school education, uh, Adam and Eve are these cavemen that just, you know, just crawled up out of the swamp, you know, had a couple kids, and one kills the other kid. Now there's three people on earth, and, and they're all, you know, like cave dwellers. And, and they, then, of course, then none, none of it makes sense. How is this even possible? But go back and let it speak. God made Adam in his image. Eve is going to be the life of all, all people. She's a, a people producer. And when they have a daughter, that daughter's going to become a people producer. They're tr the more they can produce, the more productive they're going to be, the closer they're going to be in God's plan. That's the way salvation's going to come about. And so uh, with that in mind, let this kind of, let these people be a little more civilized as we read this. Okay, chapter 4, verse 1, I'll read through this quickly. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She says, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Now, this is the NIV translation. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, a very important line right there, course of time, 
Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the word, that word but is also the word and. So you can't read too much into that. Like Cain did this, but Abel did this. It's not, it can be a contrast, but it can simply be uh, Cain did this and Abel did this. Because that's going to be, because we've got to figure out why is Cain's offering not looked upon. But Abel brought fat portion from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, now this verse, I've got it in the notes, uh, the commentators, most of them refer to something like this. this. This verse 7 coming up here, verse 7, we're in 6 right now, is, is the, even the Jewish scholars, they, they say this is, we're not sure what this means. It's, it's undecided on the total, the general meaning of what is said, it, that can be captured, but the, wh- how these words fit together and what is actually being said uh, they struggle with. And so we've got translations of it, and we go with the translations, but you don't realize the struggle the translators went through to settle on this. Instead of just saying, you know, a blank and putting a question mark, a blank and putting a question mark, you've got to put something in there. So they discuss it, they vote on it, they r- argue about it, and they translate it. If someone doesn't like it, they make their own translation. So here's the NIV translation for 6 and 7, and number 7 is a difficult translation. Then the, Lord God, then the Lord, Yahweh, said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Notice the two things. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you, go, if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, and in the Hebrew it just says, Cain spoke to his brother Abel. And that's it. It doesn't say what he said. Here it says, let's go out to the field. In fact, there's a footnote here. What does this footnote say? Yeah. The Masoretic text does not have, let us go out to the field. In the Hebrew, it says, Cain spoke to his brother Abel. And it's like, and where's the quotation? There's nothing there. He spoke to him. We, it, 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 and so this is added. This is somewhere along the line. This was put in there. Even in the footnotes, it says, uh, let's go out into the field. And then, and, the, and, and you know how, and you hear it says, uh, and I'm, I'm off subject, not off subject, but I'm ahead. But how does, how does Cain kill Abel? He hits him in the head with a rock. He says, let's go out into the field, and then he killed him with a rock. And then he, he doesn't say, let's go to the field, and he doesn't hit him in the head of the rock. It's just because we're th- I'm thinking about cavemen, and, and, and they, they, they just think, well, the only they've got is, is rocks. Well, they're, they're cutting up sacrificing animals. Uh, they, the Lord skinned an animal and gave him clothing. Well, well they haven't developed metal, 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 metallology yet. Yeah, but they can still make stones that are tools, you know, flint knives, if nothing else. So... If you read in 1 John, the word used there is, is slay. It gives the impression of, of, of a knife cut, like, like slit his throat. But we don't know exactly what it was. But just realize the, the, the culture that I'm from only allows him to have a rock and just beat him in the head with a rock. And that's not what the text says, and, and there's a lot more going on. Nonetheless, and while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother, Abel? Again, this was a call to repentance. This is not God asking dumb questions. It's like, uh, here's your chance to. But Cain, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord says, what have you done? Again, just like he, he he did the same thing. He asked Adam, where are you? And then he says, what have you done? Or gave, you know, the same thing. And then here comes to pronounce it. Then he says, listen, or voice, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. 
when you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crop for you. I guess there's a kind of a clue. His brother's blood went into the ground. So, I mean, you could hit someone in the head and them not bleed. You could choke them out and them not bleed. So it, it, I would appear, I, I would assume there's some kind of a knife wound. Some kind of a, again, I'm assuming that, but that's all the information we got. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crop for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain says to the Lord, my, it's interesting, he goes to the Lord and says, this is too much. It's almost like an act of faith. I mean, he's crying out for help. Don't want to give him too much credit, but at the same time, God responds to him. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Yes, indeed it is. It's designed to destroy you. It's not, you're not supposed to bear it. It's supposed to destroy you. I added that. Today, you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. Which, again, he's going further from the Garden of Eden. If the presence of God is in Eden, he's going to be away from God's presence further. They're thinking locality. And I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Now, that also leads to the idea of a high population, or at least a larger group of people. Because that would be... Uh, you know, the ideal of, of, of family blood. You, you killed, you know, Cain killed Abel. Well, who's going to want vengeance for Abel's blood? Abel's family is going to come get Cain. Now, again, it's going to say Cain knew his wife and they're going to have a children, but it doesn't say Cain didn't get married until after he killed Abel. And it doesn't say Abel didn't already. If Cain and Abel are the first two children is very likely they've already been married and have already got a family, especially with the idea that Cain is going to build a city uh, and his son is going to name it after his son Enoch. And so there's already people in the earth. And people aren't dying as quickly, you know, in you know, like generations. They're, they're living over the, over the top of each other, not like today. Uh, whoever finds me will kill me, you know, because Abel's family's coming after me. But the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. So whatever happens, if you, no one's going to kill Cain, you'll be punished seven times what you do to Cain. I'll do seven times to you. In fact, God becomes Cain's protector. God is protecting Cain. Not justifying the sin. Cain is being punished for the sin, but God is going to protect him and allow Cain to live his life out and so seven times god is protecting that's the that's the the deal um seven times over then the lord put a mark uh on cain so that no one who or no one who found him would kill him again we'll talk about that uh, what's that mark it, it's you know i don't know uh so cain went out from the lord's presence now, I thought they were already living outside the Garden of Eden. Well, they are outside of Eden, but they're living next to it. I would, I, in my mind, as I study this, I think of Eden as being the temple in Jerusalem. It's not the temple in Jerusalem, but it's like the temple. And then the outer court is where the Jews could bring the offerings. They had an altar, a burnt offering. They had the bronze basin. They could approach the presence of the Lord. And that's where Cain and Abel would be. They'd be, in, the, in a sense, the outer court where now, that's where Adam and Eve have to live in the outer court. Cain is driven away. He can't even come up into the area of Eden. He's driven from the Lord's presence. I'm reading into that what I would think that's talking about. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So there's another whole land away, east of Eden. Cain lay with his wife. Now, you see, it doesn't say Cain found a wife. Uh, Cain lay with his wife, so it, there's room to assume that he already had a wife. In fact, he may already have children. But they would probably be staying back in the presence of the Lord. So now Cain is off by himself, takes his wife, and is going to start, you know, living away from, the, I, I don't know. Cain lay with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city. When Enoch was born, he was building a city. Is that the people that traveled with him from the presence of God? Is that his family leaving Abel's family? I mean, how can you build a city with a wife and, and a son that's just been born? 
To Enoch was born Irad. Irad was the father of Mahujala. Mahujala was the father of Methusel. Methusel was the father of Lamech. Interesting, some of those names are similar. What are going to be in, in uh, Seth's line? Lamech, now here's, here's the ending right here. Lamech married two women, one named Ada, the other named Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal. Now here comes their occupations. Now these people were probably living in the city or they're living around the city in the pastures around taking care of the livestock that's going to be used to feed the city. Uh, Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. And that would probably be outside the city of Enoch. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who play the harp and the flute, which would indicate they're entertainers. There's some kind of artistic line developing to entertain the people in the city. Zillah also had a son, Tubal-Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Now, tools would be weapons and equipment, not jewelry. Out of I, not, not that they haven't, but they're talking here. The context is equipment. Tubal Cain's sister was Nama. Now, Lamech ends up killing somebody. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. Uh, if Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. And this again is the arrogance of or the pride that comes from the Garden of Eden through Cain's line. It appears the Lord is going to defend Cain seven times. If anyone harms Cain, the Lord will punish them seven times. Lamech says, apparently, I don't need the Lord. I can take care of myself. I've got my own weapons. I killed a man because I tell you what, I'll pay back 77 times if someone, he injured me, so I paid him back myself. I'm not waiting on the Lord to get vengeance. I took it myself. The Lord will pay seven times vengeance. I will pay 77 times myself. No one mess with me. So that is Lamech. That would fit very well, that attitude, uh, right before the flood. When wickedness of man was uh, uncontrollable, that would fit. That's that generation that's going to be flooded again. It doesn't say that in the text, but that ends with his four children being listed. That ends the genealogy, which obviously all these people died. And this line does not exist today. There obviously are, well, I would say obviously there's not any uh, genetics of Cain in the earth today because they all were wiped out. But you're going to have Noah's sons, and they all married three women. And are they relatives from the line of Seth? Or are they, you know, again, the safe idea would be say Cain's line's all wiped out. But again, you got those three wives that were married into the sons of Noah. Verse 25, Adam lay with his wife again. I will point this out. We mentioned Eve earlier. Eve gave birth to Cain and Abel. That was the second time her name is mentioned. Her name is mentioned when Adam names her. And then her name is mentioned when she gives birth to Cain and then his brother, Abel. And that's the last time Eve is mentioned in the Old Testament. You don't find the name Eve in the Old Testament. Her name, when Adam names her and when she gives birth to Cain and then Abel. Here, she's mentioned, but not by name. Adam lay with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son named, and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. See, now right there, that sure sounds like there's only three boys, Cain, Abel, and Seth. And when Abel's dead, she gets pregnant and replaces Abel with Seth. Because, that, because if she would have had, like I was saying, you know, 50, 75 children, well, surely someone would have replaced Abel by that time. So again, that, that, I just take note of that, but that could be looked at a little bit differently. Seth, Seth also had a son, and he named him Enosh. And then here's the verse. At that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. And there's, there's that reference right there. Uh, so Seth's line is calling on the Lord. Cain's line is saying, we can do it ourselves. We do not need the Lord taking care of us. Page two, please, of the notes. 
And we'll try to go through the first eight verses and point some things out here. Now Adam and Eve, or excuse me, now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And that is exactly what the promise was. The woman will give birth, and that seed will bruise the head of the serpent. Uh, and so she, this, the process of salvation has begun in the sense that Adam and Eve are not the last people on earth that, ah, the line continues. We've got another generation. Life has been handed down, and it's been being handed down ever since then. So that is one level of salvation. Humanity is going to continue. The other ideal is that through that line of humanity, there's going to come a Savior uh, that will deliver mankind. Uh, and again, that's not highly developed at this point yet. Uh, first point one, the word new is the word yada. Uh, in the Hebrew, it means to know. It's used 942 times in the Old Testament. Um, most often the phrase yada, it means to know, to learn, like to learn a subject, to know a subject. Sometimes by perception, sometimes by experience. I've learned this, or I know this, or I perceive this. And that's what the word means. Yada can also refer to knowing a person, like I'm acquainted with this person, or I, I know this person, or you can know a land, or the Israelites were not supposed to know the foreign gods, and we're not supposed to know the other gods. You don't know these, you have no relationship, you don't know information, you do not have a relationship with these other gods. But yada can also be used to refer to sexual intercourse when used in certain contexts, and that's what's being used for right here. And I've got some written down here. There's many times in the Old Testament Yada is used for that. Genesis 19, 8. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Lot says that in Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 24, 16. The young woman, Rebecca, was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. Uh, and I get, just give you examples, uh, and you can read. There's just different places that you can see Yada is being used. So again, Yada itself doesn't mean sexual intercourse. It means just generally to know, but you can know the subjects, but to know your wife, in Adam's case here, or to know a woman would mean to have sexual intercourse. So that's just how that, that plays out right there. And she conceived, bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. So the Lord gave the promise, and the Lord has fulfilled his promise, and this is the Lord's work that we are now continuing to produce. Once again, I'll, I'll point out, it, it doesn't say anything about this, uh, and not everybody that's born is mentioned in the Bible, but it doesn't appear that Adam and Eve had any children until Cain. That that's just seems like that's, that's going to be an accepted fact. Uh, that would mean that they were in the Garden of Eden uh, for a period of time without having children, which means having children in a natural sense she would have started having children fairly soon, which means they, didn't, they had, probably didn't spend much time. This is, again, assumption. Uh, they didn't spend much time in the Garden of Eden. It may, it may have been a, a few days. And then as soon as they're out of the Garden of Eden, uh, with the promise that you're going to need children to keep the human race going because you're going to die, in, in a sense, they didn't need children in paradise because they're not going to die. The human race is fine with Adam and Eve. But once they sin and are removed, now death has come, the only way humanity is going to survive is you need to start cranking out people because you're going to die. And then when you die, it's over. And so there's, an, uh, there's room to think that they were in the Garden of Eden for a very short period of time, and now they're out, and they start having children right away. Okay, chapter 4, verse 2. And again, she bore his brother Abel, which goes along with the line of thinking. She's going to just keep having children. Now Abel was the keeper of sheep and Cain the worker of the ground. The two occupations are given. So already they're going two different directions. Uh, Abel's watching sheep, probably goats also. Uh, Cain is working the ground, just like Adam was created for. Nothing wrong with Cain's occupation. Nothing wrong with producing crops. They've got to eat. God told them, you're going to continue to produce crops. It's just going to be more painful. But you're going to need food, so planting is not... The ground is cursed. It's not going to be as easy to produce. So there's nothing wrong with Cain for following his father's career, especially when that's what his father was created for, to work the ground. So I'm not going to accept anybody saying, well, Cain uh, should have been working the ground. He should have been, well, that was man was made for this. The problem is not 
he's a farmer. The problem is not he's working the cursed ground. God made provisions for a man to survive on the cursed ground. Okay, so there we go, page 3. There's the Hebrew there. You've got the list of the people I went through. Chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. And then, uh, if you read the next verse on page 5, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. Okay, let's go back to page 3 and look at this. Uh, first thing, in the course of time, the phrase course of time uh, gives the ideal of some kind of weekly, like you could have every seventh day would be a course of time. It could be something monthly. It could be seasonal, you know, like planting seeds, harvest season. Are there seasons before the flood? That's another. There may not be seasons as we know them uh, because God kind of establishes seasons after they get off the ark. So something's going to take place there. Uh, it could be an annual. Uh, remember, the Jews are going to have an annual calendar of their celebrations. This fits something like that, that there's a, a routine, there's a ritual, there's a course, there's a time not to offer sacrifices, but oh wait, it's come now, the course of time, it's now time to offer, the, or again, it's not the word sacrifice, it's the word offerings. And so they're going to be making offerings. And again, I would suggest, again, you don't have to accept this, but here's the Garden of Eden, Here's the, the gates of the Garden of Eden. Here's the tree of life right over here. And there's the cherubim guarding it here and guarding it here. And man can no longer come in. But they're going to bring up, they're going to have some kind of altars or something here that they're going to come up and present, you know, their sacrifice. And there's different people coming up to the presence of the Lord. This would be like a temple, exactly like a temple. That They've got the trees, you've got the cherubim, you've got the presence of God, just like you've got trees, cherubim, and the presence of God in the temple. This is where the altar is on the outside, where you bring your offerings up. Again, I'm adding this to the story, but they're coming into the presence of the Lord in the course of time. There's a lot of things in this chapter that do not line up with the Mosaic Law. A lot of terminology, burnt offerings, peace offerings, fellowship offerings, even sacrifice. A lot of the words that are in the Mosaic Law that we say, ah, here it is, it's not there. This is not the Mosaic Law. These are different. There, there's some similarity because Cain, uh, Cain's going to be bringing some kind of a grain offering. Abel's going to be bringing some kind of a fat offering. But it's not, in, it's not the structured uh, Mosaic Law. Also, I'll tell you this because we've been saying there's connections, all these stories, the creation story, the flood story, the Tower of Babel story in Mesopotamia. There's no, as far as, uh, as I could tell and, and as writers were, there's no story in any of the cuneiform writings up to this time where in the early days a brother kills another brother. So this is a, an example of a story that's not in, in these tablets. We don't say, ah, look. Here's a story of another brother killing another brother, and they're arguing over, and there's a, it's not there. There's nothing uh, for comparisons, which is interesting because there's so many things are already duplicated or there's uh, a twist type of a story. This one's wide open. Okay, uh, continuing on page 3. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering. Uh, that word offering, I've got it underlined at the end of the Hebrew on the left side. It is the word minha. It means offering, it means gift, it means tribute. So Cain is bringing a gift, a tribute, an offering. It, it's not a sacrifice. There's nothing here about blood. There's nothing said here about sin. There's nothing here about atonement. It's more like a gift, a recognition of, of God. I, I'm, I'm reading the text. Uh, in Exodus, Leviticus... It, this same word is used of a grain offering. So this, this, this offering, that is also means gift, in the uh, Exodus, Leviticus, the Law of Moses, it is a 
grain offering. Now, a grain offering is totally different from, you know, a, 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 a burnt offering, uh, bur uh, some kind of the blood being poured out. It's 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 something different, and so that's where, where this is at. Uh, it's used. This phrase "minna" is used 211 times in the Old Testament. It, it's not a rare word, but it is not the word sacrifice. It's an offering. Um, turning the page. Uh, it then says uh, the word uh, Abel brings, oh, I'm going to read this back here. Uh, Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And that's in the square on the top of page four. The word fat is chelub. It means fat. It also is not a burnt offering of a whole animal. It is not a blood offering for atonement. It is used in Exodus and Leviticus 92 times as fat. And this is the portion of the animal that is cut off of the organs. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not blood. It's not the organs. And it's not necessarily the meat. The, the fat of the offering would be cut off and burnt, as a, uh, burnt on the altar. And the meat would be then eaten by the priest. So there's several things here to look at. But like I said right there, used in, the, in Exodus and Leviticus 92 times as fat that is removed and burnt as a gift, as an offering to God. Now, sometimes the whole animal is burnt. Sometimes the blood is poured out. This is a fat offering. So they're, they're both, both are offerings. One is the... Uh, the grain offering or the fruit, the other is the fat. That's just the information. Uh, point two, I think I went through everything on point two there. Point one is the course of time. Uh, point two, yeah, point two D. The normal word for mosaic sacrifice is zeba. It is not used here. So when mo the mosaic law talks about an animal sacrifice, it's zeba. It's not this word. And this does not have the mosaic flavor, the rituals, no mention of sin. I already said that. Many things are not known concerning these offerings, rituals, and worship. So once again, I, I bail out of this whole conversation. This is before the Tower of Babel. This is before the flood of Noah. This is before the Mosaic Law. This is back there. What are they doing? Well, they're not fulfilling the Mosaic Law. It's not there yet. Uh, they, they're not offering blood. It, it's not an atonement. Uh, so many things are not known. Uh, and they're not calling on the name of the Lord yet. That happens at chapter 4, verse 25. Abel's, point three, Abel's fat brought from the firstborn of the flock. Uh, I've got everything written down there. I think I've said that. Up ah, 3C is interesting. Mesopotamia did not practice this type of offering. It is found among the Hittites, the Canaanites, and the Phoenicians. So up until this time, there's not the type of sacrifice that we'd even find uh, going on in these records right here. They're, they're not doing this type of thing yet in Mesopotamia. Uh, now, point four, a very important topic. And again, you can spend some time thinking about this. You may have an opinion already. Why Cain's offering is not accepted is not explicitly stated. Cain, what's wrong? Now, I will tell you what I used to say. It was easy. Fun teaching, made a good point. Uh, it, was, it, it didn't have blood in it. I, I would say, and it's, it's not necessarily wrong, I just disagree with it, Cain's offering was uh, from the cursed ground of his own human work. It was his own human work. He produced a crop and offered to God for his atonement for sin. But Abel brought in an animal that he had to kill, that had a blood offering, and it was to atone for his sin. It was Abel confessing or recognizing his sin. So Cain brought human works. Abel brought grace. I need salvation, and the animal represents my, my sin. And, and that works with the New Testament. That works with the death of Christ. We're, we're saved through Christ's righteousness, not our good works. Isaiah says that. And that, you can say that if you want to. But it's never said in the text. It's never explicitly or even not implicitly within the text 
I, I'm reading a lot into that. I mean, I, I've done it before. So point 4A, first of all, it was a deficiency in the type of offering or a deficiency in the person bringing the offering. Some reason God is saying, Abel, fine. Cain, I'm not even looking at it. So is the offering deficient? Maybe. Or is the offerer deficient? Uh, we'll look at a couple other things as we go. Abel's offering included blood to atone for sin. Cain's was an offering of human works. I'm just saying the same thing I just said. But 4B1, but yet the grain offering was something God accepted in the law of Moses. I mean, this, this grain offering was accepted in the law of Moses, so God can't, wasn't upset with it in Moses' law. And Cain was working in the profession that his father was working in. So what is Cain doing wrong with his offering? He's bringing what God gave him to bring. Uh, some say it is based on divine election. Now, this is the worst idea, I think. Some say it's based on divine election. Really, some people say it's, it's divine election. Uh, and so no one knows why Abel was selected by God and Cain was rejected other than God's choice. Meaning, God chose Abel, he rejected Cain. So it goes. And again, you can understand where that's coming from. And I think that's a pretty lame explanation of the whole, <laughs> this, the fourth chapter. It's like, ah, we've already in the divine election here, and God chooses some and sending others to hell. But God doesn't approach it that way. God, God actually gives Cain a way out. Okay, you, you can go with that if you want to. Point D, if anything was deficient, and that deficiency is revealed in the text and is addressed by God, it was Cain. Because what's going to take next, God is not going to tell Cain, well, bring me something worthwhile. I, I need a blood offering. I, your brother Abel, he, he did it the right way. You bringing me these lousy gourds and watermelon, not even interested in this. He doesn't, he doesn't challenge Cain's offering. He challenged Cain's person himself, I, I think. And we'll see that. It seems that Cain may have had some sin issue in his life that prevented God from accepting his offering. And, it's, and it could be a sin. We go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. We'll read it in a minute. Abel's offering was accepted because of faith. It says it plainly in Hebrews. Abel had faith. Cain, I guess, would not have faith, whatever that means. That doesn't say it. Uh, yet this also is not explicit and must be read into the text that there's uh, something wrong with Cain's idea here. Uh, page 3, the question concerning Cain's sin remains unanswered. And I write these things. Was Cain's sin the... Again. Was Cain's sin that already existed, is Cain in sin... And because Cain is in sin, God rejects the offering. Or does God reject Cain, and because of the rejection, Cain is now going to sin and kill Abel? So in other words, what came first, the sin or the rejection? It appears that Cain is already in some kind of, I'll say, I'll go little s sin, little s sin and God is rejecting Cain because of this little s sin and because of the rejection Cain is going to go off and commit the bigger sin and God is warning uh, Cain uh, hey this sin it wants to control you you have to master it if you don't master it it's going to control you and Cain re God rejects the offering Cain rejects God's counsel. That's what I think is happening here. Uh, point E. The writer of the book of Hebrews adds this information, making the faith of Abel the issue, implying that Cain did not have faith. Uh, he writes, by faith, this is on top of page 5, by faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. So they both offered sacrifice, or, uh, sacrifice uh, but... Abel's was more acceptable, through which he was commended as righteous. Again, was that righteous behavior or righteous being imputed to him? God commending him by accepting his gift, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Okay, uh, chapter 4, verse 5. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. A couple things right there where the word 
but Cain and his offering, he had no regard. For Cain and his offering, is it time to go? Oh my gosh, I apologize. Okay, for Cain and his offering, uh, uh, the, 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 he had no regard, it means simply to gaze. He had no regard, it means God is not, will not, is not gaze, he's not looking at Cain's offering. And it says he was very angry, Cain was, it means to burn, to be kindled with anger. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Same thing, same word, why are you angry? Why are you burning? Why are you angry? And why has your face, oh, it says, so Cain was very angry and his face fell. So right here, Cain's face, his disposition falls, giving the impression Cain is looking down. Now watch this, I'm going to make something out of this. God is gazing at Cain, or he's not gazing at Cain, but what is Cain doing? He's looking down, his face is downcast. Because of his sin, his face is downcast, and when God does gaze, potentially, he's not face-to-face -face looking at Cain. He's not, Cain's not looking at God. It's either God's looking away from Cain because of his sin, or Cain's looking away from God because of his sin. Their gazes are not connecting. Uh, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? And now watch this, and I'll pick this up next week. If you do well, will you not be accepted? In other words, this is not about your offering. It's about you doing well. And I've got it in the box down there in the Greek. Uh, it means, it's yatab. It means to be good. If you be good, if you do good, you'll be accepted. And in fact, the word accepted is also in the box. It's S-E-E-T-H in the Hebrew. It means exalted, dignity, or uprising. If you do good, will you not be lifted up? Where's his face? His face is downcast because of his sin. He's doing wrong. But if you'll do right, will not your face be lifted up? And when he lifts up his face, he's gazing at God, who's gazing at him, if we play this out. If you do well, will you not be accepted? Uh, and if you do not do well, watch it, I'll pick this up next week, sin is crouching at your door. If you continue to do wrong, and you continue to be get downcast, understand, sin, it says, is crouching at the door. It desires, it des its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. He says there's sin, this little sin is crouching at your door, if you don't come back and rule it, dominate it, it is going to dominate you. And that's what happens. And you've got that written down right here. I'll pick this up next week. I've already said that, I know. But the word for uh, uh, is, is crouching is the word R-O-B-E-S in the Hebrew. It means to stretch oneself out, to lie down, to lie stretched out. And it's, there's sin is lying. And that word sin means sin. It's lying by the door. Uh, it means to lie down by the door. Apparently, a door opening that Cain's going to be walking out, and it desires to control him. And if you look over here, I'll let you read it yourself, and I'll pick it up next week. If you look at point four on page six, it's very, the word is, and some commentators more and more are, because again, this is difficult, are going with this. Uh, it is, the word uh, crouching is very similar to a word uh, that is si uh, the, the word of a Mesopotamian from this area, a demon that would sit by doors and wait for the victim or the person to walk by and jump out and grab them. And this is saying this demon is sitting, crouching by the door, and it wants to control you, but you're going to have to turn and control that demon, that sin, that spirit. Otherwise, that spirit is going to control you. And uh, we'll pick that up next week, and obviously he doesn't, and uh, he goes off and ends up killing his brother, which leads to a bigger sin and a bigger problem for Cain. Uh, again, a lot of, I don't know if you feel there's, a, we've got the general story, you can tell the story in three minutes, but there's a lot of things taking place there. I mean, how many people are involved? I mean, in the whole civilization, where is these altars? Are they atoning for sin? Are they just fellowship offerings? Uh, what, is, what does Abel believe? He has faith. What is his faith in? The promise that his mom and dad were given that the seed was going to bruise the serpent's head? Uh, you know, so I mean, there's many things going on here. 
a lot of history that's reduced to a, a few phrases and a few images or pictures that, you know, once again, I'd like to have you know, more information. I'll pray and, and we're finished for tonight. Father, I do thank you for the chance to look into these things. We do ask that we ourselves, with this information, be able to take warning that even now today in our own lives there's sin and there's, there's opposition trying to control us and destroy us, that we ourselves, because of your Spirit, especially in this age of the church age, have the ability to choose righteousness, to walk in righteousness, and allow the Spirit of Christ to dominate our own lives as we stay in fellowship with you. We do ask that we do the things you've called us to and that we ourselves would be people of faith and obedient and look for your goodness in our lives and share that with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time.